Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our 2024 spring training series. My name is Daniel Napolitan, and I'm a marketing specialist here at ESC Spectrum. Today presenting, we have Sarah Moody, one of our regulatory and reporting engineers, and she'll be discussing evaluating and changing the NOx maximum emissions rate default. As you can see on the right-hand side of your screen, there's a chat box. Type into the QA panel or chat box to interact with our speaker, and feel free to discuss any topics throughout the webinar. Keep in mind, everyone can see what's in the chat box. Uh, Sarah will answer any of your questions to the best of her ability uh, as she presents. And just a reminder, this webinar will be recorded and will be available immediately after using the same link that you used to register. Uh, the recording will also be uploaded within the following week on our customer community. With that being said, let's begin the training. Thank you, Dan. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, like he said, we'll be able to see questions, and this is kind of um, a broad topic, so if you have questions as you go, I would like to kind of not save them for the end. So it's going to be broken up into a few different sections, so feel free to interrupt, and it'll give me a break from talking, and we can um, answer them the best we can. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and begin. Okay. Um, you have probably saw what I'm going to be talking about, but I just wanted to reiterate my own words. Um, this is a presentation on evaluating and changing the NOx maximum emissions rate default. Um, why that's important, you could be over-reporting on NOx by using unnecessarily high defaults during missing data substitution. Um, I recently did a project for a customer and realized that I didn't know necessarily the correct way to do it based on the monitoring plan instructions. So, that's why I'm doing this. Um, and the correct way to determine your NOx default for MER, you must evaluate and find an, a new MPC, maximum potential concentration. Um, what this could then lead to are new span and ranges. So there's a few different things that go into this. You can't just find the new MER and say, okay, this is it, this is my new default. It's a little more involved than that. Um, no big deal. And there's lots of documentation on how to do it. And that's what I'm gonna be going over today. Um, part of having a new analyzer span and range and what, how that ties into this is you're supposed to be evaluating your span and range every year as part of Part 75. So you must examine your historical SIMS data at least once per year to see if the current span and range values meet the guidelines in Section 2.1 in Appendix A. This is a really good indicator if your MER needs updating. If you see that you're not complying with your current span and range, that's when you investigate look for a new MPC, and then you're probably going to have a new MB MER because MPC is directly used in the equation for MER. And if that doesn't make sense, like I said, just stop, ask me a question. Okay, what do the recs say? Again, every year you should be doing a span and range evaluation. This can be done in any quarter of the year. Um, since I'm a regulatory engineer and I have my own set of customers, I kind of have them on my own schedule, so I'll put in my data review, okay, I'm going to do span and range, you know, in January, and I'm going to be looking at the past four calendar quarters. Um, they To comply, you must be within 20 to 80 percent of your full-scale range. Um, this does not apply to the high end of NOx, so keep that in the back of your mind, but um, I, I do that every year for my customers, and if something's off, then we talk about it, make sure that that's applicable and make a change when necessary. So you sh if you think your MER is too high, you should be doing this span and range evaluation every year. Maybe find a new MPC that's applicable to put you back in that 20 to 80, and then you'll have an MER. But your thought process should be, my MER is really high, I'm over-reporting, how do I change that? And that's where you'll come back to this. Okay, so this is from the monitoring plan instructions for a NOx diluent monitoring system in pounds per millimeter BTU. Um, calculate and report your MPC, or sorry, maximum potential NOx emissions rate based on the MPC for use with missing data procedures. So this is kind of a visualization of, you know, new MPC and MEC, you're going to have a new span and range and a new maximum emissions rate. 
Okay. So like I said, I have my customers on a schedule that I do every year. This is where I'm going to do it in Stack Vision. I'm going to check the MPC status by going to reports. And so if you have Stack Vision open right now, you could practice this. Um, reports, QA and certification, part 75, and then you're going to select analyzer range evaluation. From there, you want to view, um, I do at least four QA quarter or four calendar quarters worth of data. Um, so if I'm doing it for a customer today, I'm probably going to do quarter one of 2023 all the way to quarter one of 2024. And you should see majority of operating hours between 20 to 80% of the range. Um, if you have a dual range Knox analyzer, they're exempt from the 2080 rule on the high range. So you see here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but if you look um, where it says CT1 Knox high S, and then it says 15 and 100, it says that 100% of the hours are below 20%. And same thing for the Knox low S on the 100 span, that, that does not apply. So what I'm looking for is that 15 is 20 to 80%. So I would look at that and say, OK, we're good for the year. I don't have any recommendations for changing. Um, but if you're like, you know, maybe more like 51 percent is 20 to 80 and 49 percent or elsewhere, that's when we would say, OK, yes, technically the majority is in the 20 to 80. This could still be changed. This could still be adjusted. Um, so I have a customer right now that that's what we're doing. So you kind of have to decide for yourself based on how your site operates what's actually true and what actually makes sense. Okay, um, from here, let's say it was not within 20 to 80 and I'm now needing to find a new MPC. Um, this is where you would do it in Data Lab in Stack Vision. So you all know where Data Lab is, Tools, and then Data Lab. And what you have to do is find the highest valid Knox reading over at least 720 full operating hours. I'm not looking at an hour where it was a calibration. Um, it could still be a startup or shutdown. That's kind of site specific. But this, you know, keep in mind this value, this default is going to be used for missing data substitution. So you want that value to be representative of something happened at the site. I'm going to be using this to substitute. So for this particular site, I found 5.4. I didn't do a deep dive because I was just finding an example. Um, so later when you see my calculation and that the value is really low, you're going to think, why can't mine be that low? That's probably not actually accurate. I just needed a little screenshot to show you guys where you would find it. Are there any questions so far on navigating Stack Vision and those reports that I pulled up to look for this information? Doesn't look like we have any questions, Sarah. OK, just double check in and giving myself a second to breathe. <laughs> OK, so in the monitoring plan instructions, it's very clear how to calculate this. Um, if you have if you're calculating Knox MER, this is the formula you will use if your diluent is O2. I had a pre question um, before the presentation about what's the best diluent to use so that you're not using the highest number possible for missing data substitution. That's definitely dependent on site operation, equipment. A lot of factors go into that. You can have a conversation maybe with the technicians about that. If there's maybe something you're wanting to change or you have the financial ability to change at the site, if that's something that you're interested in, um, definitely talk to the techs. I can't really say, oh, you for sure need to be O2. It's just not that simple. Um, but this is how you would calculate using O2. For me, when I'm doing this, there's a few options here. Your maximum oxygen concentration during normal operating conditions or diluent cap of 14% for boilers and 19 for turbines. And or if the MPC is derived from historical data, um, the O2 reading recorded at the hour of the MPC may be used. I'm pretty conservative with this, so I'm going to probably use the diluent cap of 14 or 19 where it's applicable. That's just me. It makes me feel better. But 
like I said, um, do whatever is more applicable for your site. You know how it operates more than anybody else. Unless I'm your reporting engineer, then I probably know more than you do. Just kidding. Okay. Same. Uh, here's for CO2. Oh, I forgot to mention. So the last one was equation F5. This is also equation 19.1. So if you are looking and you're seeing a different equations being used, these are identical. 19.1 and F5 are identical. F6 is for CO2, so changes a little bit, like your um, fuel factor is going to be different, and then your CO2. You have a dilient cap of 5% for boilers, 1% for turbines. Or again, if you're using historical data, which is the way I'm presenting it, we are using historical data. We're looking at 720 hours of historical data. You could use the CO2 reading um, recorded at the hour of the MPC. So you have a few options here. <clears throat> This is the same thing. This is also in the monitoring plan instructions, but it's it's um, a table view with more detail of what those constant values, where those constant values are coming from. So like I said, 19.1 and F5 here at the top are the same. And then if you're like, what does that CD mean or FD? I think that just means fuel factor dry basis. But if I didn't know, I would double check <clears throat> on the right hand panel and see, okay, I wanna make sure I'm getting the right um, the right value to plug in here. And I believe, I don't know off the top of my head, this might be page like 90 something in the monitoring plan instructions. And if you don't know what I'm referring to, ECMPS has instructions on emissions, monitoring plans, and QA files. So we rely on those very heavily in the reporting group. Um, the monitoring plan instructions have saved me numerous times, especially when troubleshooting ECMPS errors. So I'd highly recommend downloading those if you don't have them already. Um, if you do have them, I think the only change this year was some good neighbor plan information. So maybe update those based on that if that is going to apply to you. But I would definitely recommend downloading these every year or two just to be up to date. And they come in very, very handy. I think this is page like 94 or 96, something like that. Okay. Um, this is an example calculation. This is how I would do it for a customer. Like I was showing you earlier, that 5.4 was the maximum in data lab. Here's their fuel factor, and I'm conservative, so I'm using 19% for a turbine. That is a really low number. ECMPS is going to make me put 0 0.1. Um, like I said, this isn't maybe a true representation, but this is just me showing you simply how to do it. Plugging in my numbers, and that's my result. And then what I would do is set up a meeting with my customer and say, okay, you know, I did an evaluation. Here's the new MPC. Um, I used it to calculate your MER. This is what we're looking at. It's probably going to be an improvement. If not, then it is what it is. That's just your site operation changed. Um, maybe your fuel changed, whatever. Um, and then we would just talk about the next steps, which would be span and range adjustments. Cylinders need to be ordered. Monitoring plans need to be changed and imported. Um, and I'm going to speak to that, but I'm just letting you know at this point in the state, in the steps, this is what I would be doing. Um, I just actually remembered something. If you have multiple fuels, you will use the highest combusted fuel in your evaluation. So if you have natural gas and oil, you're going to look at hours with oil running. Okay. This is ECMPS 1.0. We have all seen it. This is where you will find your current default. So if you're in ECMPS, we all know that left-hand corner, you'd go to monitoring plan data, and then it's under default. So here is an actual screenshot from a customer I've been working with. This is their previous value is 2.015. I'm honestly not certain where they got that number from. We tried to calculate it. Um, no idea where it came from. It was last done in 2004. So obviously it was time for a new one. And this is what their new value is going to be. So you can see that is a major improvement. And that's why this is so important. OK. Um, if you were my customer, this is probably what I would send you, this pretty little graphic on the left. So that's what I did for this customer who this is their new default. Um, they have a new MPC. So what I did was send them, okay, 
your new MPC is going to be 100. Your new low span and range is going to be 40. Low does not have an MPC because it's a controlled value. Um, I'm sorry. It, yes, it has. Let me double check. Yeah, no, it has an MEC, but not an MPC. I didn't want to misspeak there. So I would send them, okay, here are your new linearity um, ranges, and here's your daily cows for not your high and your low. Where I'm getting these from, this is just the linearity specification. So low level, mid level, and high level, you know it needs to be 20 to 30, 50 to 60, 80 to 100. Daily cows, low level, 0 to 20. Mid level, 50 to 60. High level, 80 to 100. So <clears throat> I'm sending that to them as a... Um, just a reference document, you know, for, okay, you're going to need to order some cylinders because your MPC changed dramatically enough. Um, maybe you don't have those cylinders on site. Maybe you do. Um, just make sure that they're PGVP and they're NIST certified, um, and you should be good to go if you have them on site, and they'll work with your new values. And you can see, like, these are pretty low. I know some people have had trouble in the past, but in this case, you may be dual range and then no longer need to be dual range. That's another thing this can save you from. In this case, this customer could get away from being dual range um, and go to single range and spend less on cylinders. So there's it, there's more to it than, oh, my MER is lower. I may not be over-reporting. It can save you in other ways as well. Keep in mind, though, um, if you are dual range and you're greater than, or sorry, less than, no, I have the wrong symbol here. Less than or equal to 30 ppm for Knox Low, you are not required to report a linearity. I'm not certain ECMPS would even let you try to report a linearity if it was under 30 ppm. So um, keep that in mind for Part 75 purposes. When you do this valuation, if you are dual range and your Knox Low is now going to be 30 ppm or lower for your span and range, you don't have to do, you don't have to report that linearity anymore. So something to keep in the back of your mind. Okay, timelines for notification. So you've done an evaluation, you have a new MPC. Um, that MPC was a dramatic enough change to where you have new span and ranges. Adjustments have to be made to your analyzer. That means you have 45 days to implement the changes and that 45 day countdown begins the in the quarter following your discovery. If you're changing your span and range and you're ordering new cylinders, you have more leeway because cylinders can take a longer time to come in. Um, I know during COVID, I think there were some issues with that. Hopefully it's a little more squared away now, but if not, you have 90 days to order cylinders and implement your changes. Again, that countdown begins in the quarter following the discovery. So for me, if I'm making a change for a customer, I like to do it on a quarter boundary. So if I discovered it, in this quarter, I'm going to begin April 1st in my monitoring plan, but they have beginning 7 1, 45 or 90 days to do what needs to be done in the configuration, in the analyzer, whatever. So I, I don't know, speaking from a technician, you know, experience if that's a good amount of time or not. Um, sounds like it would be, but again, you know, there is a countdown. Um, as far as telling ECMPS what kind of notifications need to be made, from what I've read, all you have to do is up is go ahead and submit your monitoring plan. Like you don't wait for the um, new quarter to start. So, like let's say you figured out today what needs to be done, you don't need to you don't need to wait till seven one when the submission window opens to submit that monitoring plan. Go ahead and send it now, so then they know okay there is a change happening in that countdown is going to begin 7-1. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. If you're wondering where can I see what my substitute values are currently without using ECMPS and you're a Stack Vision user, um, I would recommend just looking at the monitoring plan. And so the way to do that is to go to reports, part 75, monitoring plan, and then you'll find the section labeled monitoring defaults. So here you can see what is currently in use. So you want to look for obviously one that has a begin date hour that's open. Um, or I guess you could see whenever you 
did have MDS, what was the value used? So data lab could be another way, but this is probably where I would go if I'm just quickly needing a reference for what I have. Okay, if you're in PRISM, um, disclosure, I'm not a PRISM expert. I know Stack Vision pretty well, but not a PRISM expert. So I had to get this from Susan Kennedy so that she could navigate this for me. Um, you're gonna go to monitoring plans. Um, there's a view button at the bottom that should open the plan, which looks a lot like ACMPS. So I think it's administration, part 75, monitoring plans, view. And this is available in PRISM 1.9 or later. I think I'm a visual. So yeah, administration tab, part 75, and then, oops, sorry. And then your monitoring plan. So if one has been uploaded, I think that's where you'll be able to click it and then click view, and then you can see what your current value is there. Um, so you got a little preview of my next slide. So why does any of this matter? Money. That's kind of what I'm trying to drive home here. Of course, you do not want to be over-reporting. Nobody wants to do that, um, especially with all the changes going on with the Good Neighbor Plan. Um, I know there's litigation surrounded by that, so I don't want to get into the weeds too much of, okay, this is absolutely going to save you or whatever, because we know that's going to change possibly. But by updating your MEC and MPC to be more reflective of operation, your substitute data will be more reflective during downtime. One NOx allowance equals one ton of emissions. By minimizing overreporting, you're minimizing the number of allowances needed to be surrendered or given back to the EPA at the end of the year season. Um, I don't know the current cost of each allowance, but at one point in time, they were $10,000 each. So one overreported ton could cost $10,000. Y'all understand this a lot more than I do. I'm not on that side of things, but hopefully I can speak to that part of what it's like to operate these plants. And this can be a good suggestion for just accounting purposes simply. Okay, here are some helpful links. Um, I talked about those reporting instructions. That's here at the top. Um, as far as, okay, I did this evaluation. I do need to make a change. Where do I go to make those changes in Stack Studio? Make sure you have um, community access with support. If you don't, send a support uh, case. I think it's just support at escspectrum.com and tell them I need community access. I want to be able to look up a knowledge article. This will tell you how to update your span and range in Stack Studio. Um, and of course, if you need help, the phone number and email is always available, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, Prism resources for the range, I have a direct link to that. Um, this is way over my head. Y'all probably know more than I do. Of course, you know, we have the support staff available to help. If you are uploading the span, for part 75, you can just upload a new monitoring plan and it should take care of the span for you. Um, but again, I'm in the reporting group, so I don't necessarily walk through both um, softwares every day. So just stack, mainly just stack vision. So support would be able to help you out the best. But if you are a reporting customer, your engineer should be able to help you with that. And I'm going to pause and drink some water. So if there's any questions, just pop them in the chat. Or if I need to go back to a slide, just um, let us know, please. All right. Uh, is, is there any more questions other than that, guys? Uh, if not, I'm not seeing any at the moment. Uh, if any of you have any additional questions, feel free to email Sarah or the marketing team, and we can pass that along. Uh, just a reminder, the recording for this will be available at this link once we conclude the webinar, and it will also be uploaded to our customer community within the next week. Uh, in a second, I'll also throw down a link to register for our final uh, spring training series webinar. Uh, I don't see any more questions, so thank you so much, Sarah, and uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us. Yes, Have thank you. Um, if you think of anything, again, I'm available for questions, and if I don't know the answer, I'll find you somebody who does.